and good morning to each and everyone. I am Montessa Marie S. Dalieda, and this morning, we will discuss to you administered cities with a subtopic of the stakeholders in urban governance. But before that, I will introduce first my co-members. First, we have Cabildo Rosmar C. Jr., Kabusug Jerick Loisi, Palomar Marjun, Palomar Proremi C, Palomar Rosli A, Ubina Marilu G, and lastly, we have Mylan Eva Alma Grace. Set back, relax, and listen as we're going to start the reporting. Good day, Green. Good day, classmates. Good day, everyone. I am Jerick Loisi Kabuso. And we, together with my groupmates, we will talk about the report which is uh, assigned to us, which is entitled Administered Cities. In 2008, the world passed a milestone when, for the first time in human history, more than half the world's population live in cities. Yet growth has not slowed, and predictions suggest that by 2050, 67% of the global population will live in cities. The majority of growth will take place in the global south where environmental and governance challenges are most acute. Okay, so what is administrative cities? Administrative cities were the habitations of these state rulers. Their major uh, cultural role was to serve as the locus of state administration. State offices and officers had an urban location for which they exercised a political control and economic exploitation of the surrounding rural areas. Administrative cities also had a qualitatively different demographic and social complexity. They contained large populations, densely settled, often ethnically varied with heterogeneous occupations. Such cities were nodes of communication and transportation and centers of commerce, crafts, and other economic functions for the surrounding countryside. Okay, so the administrative city had some of the properties commonly attributed to cities. It was a local of, uh, for cultural elaboration and monumental building, a repository of great wealth, but also of extensive poverty and a heterogeneous local, both occupationally and in terms of ascriptive uh, identities based on ethnicity, religion, case, or race. But it was not disorganized or impersonal. Family, guild, and ethnic group claimed the allegiances that defined the basic unit of urban cultural practice in the city quarter, which for the urban land like function with many of the characteristic professions of the peasant village. All projects in urban space are developed through the collaboration of different people and organizations such as municipalities, housing corporations, developers, city inhabitants, and designers. The city stakeholder is key to a driving city. The model of sustainable community development is changing from one of shareholders generally driven by monetary capital to one of stakeholders engaging the full spectrum of community wealth for the purpose of producing the individual and mutual well-being of all the participants in an ongoing way. Now, who are the city stakeholders? They are generally defined as people, groups, organizations, or businesses that have interest or concern in that community. Stakeholders can affect or be affected by the community's actions, objectives, and policies. Some examples of key community stakeholders are residents or the citizens such as tenants and private homeowners, community groups, developers, 
government workers and the agencies they represent, business owners or companies, neighborhood leaders, NGOs, housing corporation, educational and research institutions, and other groups from which the community draw its resources. Early efforts are found in the seminal work of Freeman, who identified a stakeholder as any group or individual who can affect or is affected by the achievement of the organization's objectives. By the 1990s, stakeholder definition and classification became more sophisticated, focusing on various criteria through which the importance of stakeholders to a given organization could be asserted. These interrelated criteria include relative power and resource relationships in terms of interdependency and influence. Stakeholders are also considered as urban developer, grid developer, energy provider, and it focuses on the sustainability, environment, and climate department, housing association, urban planning, and energy planning on a specific area. The process of urban transformation thus involves a multitude of stakeholders. There are types of stakeholders in urban governance. First, we have citizens, such as citizens and neighborhood associations, tenants and private homeowners. Second, we have companies, such as consultants, developers, corporations, and other business establishments. Third, we have government, such as national, provincial, city, and municipal. And lastly, we have non-government organizations. Now let's move on to the benefits of stakeholders' participation in urban governance. First, we have decisions taken with stakeholder input are based on a broader knowledge base. Second, stakeholder engagement from an early stage can improve the quality, acceptance, and effectiveness of projects and proposals. Third, discussions with key stakeholders may open up further opportunities for collaboration and joint projects. Fourth, stakeholder buy-in helps secure long-term support for strategies and actions in the city. And the last one is participatory decision-making is more robust and transparent. Good morning, everyone. I am Perry May Cantad Palumar, and for continuation of the topic, governance is essential for urban planning and determines the legal and administrative process that underpin development and the rules of formal and informal actors that shape urban change. National governments establish the constitutional and legal framework within which governance take place and federal government where it exists. In acts, national policy and local governments usually implement urban planning policy and manage development. There are three areas of state authority that are particularly important in urban planning. First, the power operation and financing of local government. Second, legislation relating to the ownership, occupation, use, and transfer of land rights. And the third, operation of urban and planning system. Urban governance refers to how the government in local, regional, and national stakeholders decide how to plan finance and manage urban areas. It involves a continuous process of negotiation and consultation over the allocation of social and material resources and political power. It is, therefore, profoundly political influenced by the creation and operation of political institutions. Government capacity to make and implement decisions and the extent to which these decisions recognize and respond to the interests of the poor. It encompasses a host of economic and social forces, institutions, and relationships. 
This includes labor markets, goods and services, households, social relationships, and basic infrastructures, land, services, and public safety. Urban governance is primarily concerned with the processes through which government is organized and delivered in towns and cities and the relationship between state agencies and civil society, a term that is used to include citizens, communities, private sectors, actors, and voluntary organizations. Urban governance involves a range of actors and institutions. The relationships among them determine what happened in the city. In managing urban transformations, government at all levels need to play a strategic role in forging partnerships with, with and among case stakeholders. While the city government is composed of various actors who occupy various roles in the government and undertake different functions. City government actors can be divided into two broad groups and administrative and elected. City government is the largest and most visible urban governance actor. Much of what affects the life chances of urban poor lies outside the control of city administrations. Instead, it is market and private business agencies of the central state or collective voluntary action of civil society that determine the daily experiences of urban dwellers. That's all my part. Thank you. A pleasant day to each and everyone. I am Marilu G. Ubena. And let me continue the discussion in urban planning classes, including all stakeholders. Probably the most challenging part in improving urban planning procedures and integrating energy issues is the need to broaden the spectrum of stakeholders involved in the planning of a process. So the development of a city is a matter of a wide range of stakeholders. Therefore, an open, transparent, and participatory process needs to be ensured. An approach proposed by the Urban Development Project is to establish local working groups comprising all relevant stakeholders at the city level, like administrative departments, utilities, enterprises, scientific institutions, and civil society representatives that will participate in the decision-making process and will contribute with their knowledge to find solutions that will be the most beneficial for the community and in the line with the adapted strategic vision of a city. So this urban development partnership regarding energy and climate issues is a way forward. As you can see in this table with the local working groups and their actors and external members, it is shown that the key urban actors involved in the urban transformations processes are policymakers, public officials, private sector producers, and residents' representatives. Our local working group is a platform for knowledge building between planners, managers, and experts. It illustrates all of the involved actors and their possible interrelations. Most planning theory addresses the planner as a conductor and a planner in interaction with the other actors in the urban development. For well-functioning of the local working group, it is important to have a keeper of the topic, one that ensures integrative energy planning remains on the agenda and makes progress. It must, however, be understood that none of these groups of actors is homogeneous. Community participation has increased in urban development in many DMCs through the involvement of non-government organizations or NGOs, business associations, religious associations, environmental pressure groups, associations of slum dwellers, and other community-based organizations or CDOs. In many aspects of urban development, such groups may become involved in local planning initiatives taking responsibility for infrastructure improvement and maintenance, obtaining innovative means of a credit such as community mortgage program in the Philippines, or participating in the provision of a basic services as in India and elsewhere. Clearly, the local community is a major resource that can be used in partnership with the public. 
As we all know that the urban governance is primarily concerned with the processes through which government is organized and delivered in towns and cities and the relationships between the state agencies and the civil society. Urban governance plays a critical role in shaping the physical and social character of urban regions. It influences the quantity and quality of a local services and efficiency of delivery, determines the sharing of cost and distribution of resources among different groups, and affects residents' ability to access local government and engage in decision-making, influencing local government accountability and responsiveness of the citizens' demand. So, as we know that the urban governance involves a range of actors and institutions and the relationships among them that determine what happens in the city. For managing the urban transformations, government at all levels needs to play a strategic role in forging partnerships with and among key stakeholders. The urban governance plays a critical role in shaping the physical and social character of urban regions. It influences the quantity and quality of local services and efficiency of delivery. It determines the sharing of cost and distribution of resources among different groups. And it affects residents' ability to access local government and engage in decision-making, influencing local government accountability and responsiveness to citizen demands. Again, good morning everyone. By the way, I am Rosely Academia Palomar. So my assigned topic is all about the elements that contribute to effective governance. First is the city national interface. So the effective urban governments depends not only on local institutions and actors, but also on the framework set by national governments that links the city and frontier regional and national development. However, in many contexts in adequate institutional frameworks have impeded urban governance. Next is municipal capacity. Expanding capacity to plan, manage, and finance urban growth is a fundamental component of effective urban governance. Each style of government needs sufficient capacity to ensure that physical and socio-economic planning processes are well coordinated, legally enforced, inclusive, and gross sectorial. However, many municipalities lack the skills, capacity, and resources to meet obligations. The third is the role of the private sector. So the private sector is a key stakeholder in urban and economic development. In addition to creating and providing employment, it can also be engaged in the design, constructions, and maintenance of infrastructure and provision of services. However, where the private sector has contributed to improvements at the expense of universal coverage, with blue income areas included. So lastly, but not the less, the political systems and institutions. So urban governance is political, influenced by creation and fruition of politi political institutions, government capacity to make and implement decisions, and the extent to which these organize and respond to the needs of the poor. The most vulnerable are often excluded from or ignored in decision-making processes. This, there are gaps between poor and greater of residents' access to social, economic, and political opportunities and in their ability to participate in and leverage the benefits associated with urban living. So in addition, key political economic constraints in urban areas include the governance framework. The political agency of the urban for opportunities for collective action, service delivery dynamics, the prevalence of conflict and violence, and the experience of vulnerable groups. There is no single, universally applicable model of urban governance institutions, and decision-making models reflect local context and history. However, Effective urban governance involves the city of national interface, municipal capacity, the role of private sector, and lastly, the political systems and institutions. 
Once again, good morning everyone. I am Ava Almagres Mailan and in my part, I will be discussing to you guys why does urban governance matter? Managing cities and urban growth is one of the defining challenges of the 21st century. If we manage it well, cities can act as engines of growth and provide inhabitants with better job opportunities and improve healthcare, housing, safety, and social development. Furthermore, cities can also contribute to the national growth through increased revenue generation and political stability as well as playing a role in post-conflict reconciliation. So conversely, to those cities that are poorly planned, managed, and governed can become a center of poverty, inequality, and conflict. So particularly in the country of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, they are the most poorest and fragile states because they have a poor urban governance. So basically, in many areas, especially in the Philippines, as we all know, the population has increased faster than the capacity of planners to provide houses and infrastructure and of local businesses to provide jobs. So we cannot deny the fact that mostly all countries experiencing this kind of situation and it is really important to immediately address these kind of problems so according to my research it states there that good governance was the missing link in the analysis of the failure of development strategies of many countries so in other words development and progress have been worse not because of poor economic growth but because of poor or generally a bad governance so basically bad governance exceeds when there is corruption lack of participation lack of transparency and accountability among others knowing that if you have an effective urban governance it can really affect those poor people so how we can improve the well-being of urban poor? It can improve by facilitating the access to economic opportunities, supportive social networks, and greater access to land, infrastructure, and services. If we have good urban governance, there are stakeholders who assign how to plan, finance, and manage urban areas. They ensure that socio-economic planning processes are well coordinated and legally enforced. They also implement programs to the needs of the poor that can access to social, economic, and political opportunities and the ability to participate associated with urban living. Maximizing the potential of urban areas requires institutionalizing mechanisms of coordination planning and accountability among diverse stakeholders by Fox and Goodfellow 2016. However, many city governments face severe capacity constraints, lack the vision to address urban growth and need better information and or data on poverty, the environment, and services. There are three key messages emerged that underline why urban governance matters. This is uh, from Pinoples 2015. The first key is the scale and high population density of cities enable economic and social interaction to occur more frequently and effectively. This creates the potential for cities to be productive and to offer inhabitants a better quality of life. A well productive cities can offer different opportunities for the people seeking jobs for their sustainable living. But, it should lower the standards of the company to hire a worker and to pay his or her hard work fairly and accordingly. In this way, people will never go abroad to find a job or to have a job because the country itself is offering a very good offer for them to take on. And this 
and this will make the country more productive than before. But there's only one hindrance and this would be depending to the inhabitants of a certain city if they're having a well-educated minds and attitudes. And also if they are well-educated and literate enough, then the question is, are their skills good enough to take the job over? And does it align to the job they're hired? So, so much for that. The next key is uh, to unlock this potential, key is your surrounding land, transport, public finance, and regulation need to be addressed. Making the city work requires investment in residential, commercial, and industrial structures supported by a combination of effective land markets, appropriate regulation, good public services, adequate public finance, and transparent and accountable city-level political systems. The last key is uh, harnessing urbanization. Harnessing urbanization requires smart policy and hard work. Uh, example is uh, an effective urban governance. And the implications of failure are long term. Urban governance needs a high skilled attitude and a smart way of governing. Not just by governing for the sake of its own, but to the people also. Because the people are the source of a specific person that sets its term to govern, to rule, and to make changes, not just in its society but also in its nation. That is why whoever rules our country, they should bear in their minds that we people are the root of his or her governance. Failure to rule will have a great, a great impact on individuals' minds. Just like, why did we even vote a person? If only I know that's the way of his ruling, and I should never vote that man. The policy should be good to everyone but strict, but strict so that they will know the limitations of their actions and in that way that is the kind of a good governance not just to make changes in its country but also the attitudes and behaviors of its countrymen especially the delinquent ones so that is all my part this is Martin Palomar speaking leaving a message for everyone for, of us to remember Nasa huli ang lahat ng pagsisisi, kaya siya sa atin muna bago maniwala. At huwag mong padala sa mga sinasabi ng iba. In that kind of mindset, we'll be sure our nations will become what we adored. Hello, this is Ross Smart. And for today's discussion, I'm going to discuss about some urban challenges and its developing solutions. For the first urban challenges that we're going to discuss, um, in our governance, urban challenges it might be or would be it is often inclusive neither inclusive nor um, participatory when we say it is inclusive it is um there are no exceptions all of the people are included included on those specific programs especially poor peoples or rich peoples when we say participatory um, all of the people are given a chance to participate on those specific programs now the developing solutions to address this type of urban challenge is that um, the we need to encourage the policy coordinators to consider the participation of the poor and heard their voice especially both local and regional levels so we must consider their ideas and thoughts especially for those um, problems that they are current, currently um, experiencing for the next urban challenge that would be in urbanization that would be informal settlements that may result into informal economy and the developing solutions for this challenge and that would be includes um, cultivating the land to build more infrastructures to offer more livelihoods for the poor people also policy coordinators needs to have partnerships within the private sectors governments and also to expand the opportunities for the poor people one example of infrastructures that would be factories that give livelihoods for those peoples that are on the um, average income rate and one of the government program to resolve informal settlement that would be free housing to ensure that the poor people will have a formal place to settle now for the next urban challenge that would be in urban authorities urban challenge is that they failed to provide the access of services for the poor people and the developing solutions for this challenge is that um, policy coordinators 
they must facilitate and collective actions and boost resources that may lead into accessible, affordable, and good quality services in order to improve the possible outcomes for the poor. So there are some specific programs that um, allows for those poor people to gain access for those things that they need. And the next um, urban challenge that we're going to discuss is um, urban conflicts and violence. Those are scenarios that may also affect economic development, just like terrorism, riots, protests, and etc. And these said scenarios may affect the livelihood and well-being of the poor people. And the developing solutions for this type of challenge in urban, um, urban places, that would be conflicts may be resolved by negotiations, whereas the urban authorities will participate in debates, meeting, and etc. that will help them to resolve a conflict and avoid the violence. It has also helped all the participants to indulge and take part in, in, in resolving the issue. So it, take, uh, it allows all of the people, poor people, and the government to exchange ideas to resolve the conflicts and avoid violence. Now for the next urban challenge, that would be migration. It is a process where people moving in rural areas to cities to look for their um, to look better opportunities especially in terms of development and economic opportunities and these scenarios contributes other urban issues like poverty um, overpopulation growth and employment and many more so the developing solutions for this challenge is the policy coordinators must collaborate with the governments to understand the nature of migration to formulate possible alternatives to resolve this type of issues so those policy coordinators must um, uh, collaborate with the government why migration exists, what type of needs that those people um, maybe they're one of the reasons why they migrate to another place. So they must consider those kind of things. Now for the next and the last urban challenge that we're going to discuss is that urban areas are the major contributors to an, and central in addressing of climate change. And also in the developing solution for this type of challenge is that policymakers need to better integrate international and national climate strategies. So one of the examples of this one to um, to minimize our solar uh, solar solar consumptions or electricity consumptions, we have solar panels we're using right now on those large factories here in our country. So that would be on my part. Thank you so much for listening. So as a summary, again, administered cities were the habitations of the state rulers. Their major cultural rule was to serve as the locus of state administration. State offices and officers had an urban location from which they exercised a political control and economic exploitation of the surrounding rural areas. Administrative cities also had a qualitatively different demographic and social complexity. They contained large population, densely settled, often ethnically varied with heterogeneous occupations. Such cities were nodes of communication and transportation and centers of commerce, crafts, and other economic functions for the surrounding countryside. On the other hand, Stakeholders are defined as people, groups, organizations, or businesses that have interest or concern in that community. Stakeholders can affect or be affected by the community's actions, objectives, and policies. Some examples of key community stakeholders are residents, community groups, developers, government workers and the agencies they represent, business owners, neighborhood leaders, commission members, and other groups from which the community draws its resources. And lastly, urban governance refers to how government, such as in the local, regional, and national, and stakeholders decide how to plan, finance, and manage urban areas. It involves a continuous process of negotiation and contestation over the allocation of social and material resources and political power. 
let us all remember that no single stakeholder is identified as more important than the others. But all of them are identified as necessary ingredients for success. There you have it guys. We hope that you learned something today. Thank you for listening and bye!